Today on BRC TV Tank Trials ULM Edition, it's episode four, and we're talking ULM filtration. And then we're giving away a Kessel H380 Refugium light away for free at the end. I'm Ryan, your host of BRS TV's Tank Trials ULM Edition. Tank Trials is about taking everything the BRS team and the reefing community knows about a very specific approach to reefing, implementing that knowledge, tracking the progress, and then exploring the results. This is week four of ULM and development of an ultra-low maintenance system. The goal is a stable, show-caliber reef tank, which requires as little maintenance as possible, potentially performing only a few minutes of maintenance a month. Today is all about filtration, so we're going to explore the filtration needs of each individual tank. When I say filtration, I mean discuss everything that needs to be filtered out of the tank's water to maintain an awesome show caliber aquarium. And of course, we want to do it with as little maintenance as possible to stay true to our ULM goal. So what are the undesirable elements we want to filter out of the tank? Toxic ammonia, excess nitrate, excess phosphate, floating particulate matter, uneaten food and solid fish waste, undesirable organic compounds, yellowing pigments, potentially undesirable algae or even pathogens. We'll take a quick look at all the common approaches to filtering these elements out of the tank. Starting with ammonia, which is likely the most toxic common addition and requires rapid filtration, removal, or conversion into safer forms of nitrogen in the tank. There are three main approaches to do this. By far, the most common method to do this is the use of bacteria strains, which transition ammonia into nitrite and then nitrate. Nitrate being non-toxic at common aquarium levels. More or less, the only thing required for this to happen is some type of surface area for the bacteria to populate on and water to come in contact with, like live rock or sand. It's pretty simple. There are some solutions which serve as remote surface area outside the tank with medias like marine pier or bio balls. Outside of that, there is a different approach, which is actual ammonia removal using filtration medias. The most common long-term sustainable approach is certainly the use of zeolites like the media the Zeovit system is based around. However, I would call this more of a supportive approach to ammonia filtration rather than primary. The third form of actual ammonia filtration and removal is algae growth in refugiums and algae scrubbers. I think this is less commonly understood, but many studies have shown that ammonia is very likely the preferred form of nitrogen for many algaes, meaning your fuge and algae growth could very well be one of the primary ammonia filters on your tank, potentially removing much of it before it's had a chance to transition into undesirable nitrate. Excess nitrate is of course one of the elements that we set up filtration to remove, the important word being excess. We all know there needs to be some amount of nitrogen available to the corals, so absolute zero and 100% filtration is probably a bad idea. The preferred nitrate level and proper method of filtration to achieve that is certainly up to some debate. I think we can do an entire episode on the proper nitrate level for a reef tank and almost everything that the community thinks that we know about nitrate levels is based on guesses and a ton of conflicting anecdotal experiences where some reefers have the most success with ultra low levels and others have success with moderate levels. So before we select the right nitrate filtration solutions for our ULMs, I'm going to share our take on the proper nitrate level for our reef tank that starts with the ocean's most successful reefs predominantly having very low levels of dissolved nutrients with nitrate levels often below a tenth of a part per million. However, the flip side of that is even though the levels are ultra low, the ocean's currents provides basically an infinite amount of nitrogen at these low levels. The ocean currents also provide a steady stream of nitrogen containing prey for corals to capture and utilize. There are ocean reefs where nutrients are higher than average, and I've read a handful of studies on the effect of higher dissolved nutrients. The higher levels are very frequently the result of newer ecosystem changes based on pollution. Many of these studies often find calcification slows considerably in high nutrient areas of a reef. Others find additional growth related to higher nutrient availability, particularly nitrogen. However, one thing that stays fairly constant in all of this is, in higher nutrient environments, coralline algae coverage is lower and turf and macro algae coverage is higher. This has historically been the case in reef tanks as well. Corals surviving or even thriving in a wide range of dissolved nutrient levels. However, more often than not, similar results as the ocean. High nutrients often resulting in undesirable algae growth both on the rock as well as glass, which is not only pretty undesirable from a visual standpoint, but also increases daily, weekly, and monthly maintenance. 
Now that isn't always the case and many of the reefers that have success with higher levels don't have issues with algae. It's been my experience that more times than not, this is the result of a robust, fully developed multi-year reef tanks filled with thriving corals, coralline algae, microfauna, and algae predators where there is a diligent attention to maintenance and water quality in the beginning, which allowed for this type of success later. It's not as likely that newer tanks would experience the same type of success. Higher nutrients in a newer tank almost always results in algae taking over. So all that said, my own personal take on the right nitrate level is to make an attempt to match the environment of the ocean's most successful reefs that contain the highest concentrations of successful coral colonies, with the lowest concentrations of turf or undesirable macroalgaes. Meaning similar to the ocean, as long as the nitrate level is consistently above zero, even if it's very low and below one part per million, the circulation pumps are almost certainly providing more dissolved nitrate than available in their natural habitat. In conjunction with that, attempting to provide prey-like particles like reef chili, frozen prey, broken down foods, liquid amino acids, and microfauna which contain sources of nitrogen in the form of captured prey. None of our test kits are capable of actually reading natural seawater levels below 0.1 parts per million, but the Red Sea Nitrate Pro reads down to 0.25, and in previous BRS TV Investigates episode, we found the Red Sea kit to be the most accurate as well. If you are going to attempt to be sub one part per million, the Red Sea is absolutely the best choice out there. That said, if your goal is higher for some reason and in the few to 10 parts per million or higher, I found the NIOS lower cost, accurate enough for this range, as well as easier to perform and read, so I think there's a clear choice based on your goal level. So with that out of the way, maintaining low nitrate levels was historically the bane of most reefers' existence. Very difficult to do without very careful feeding habits, and most often physically removing the nitrate by emptying the tank water containing the nitrates and then replacing it with freshly mixed seawater, which is not the most fun or cost-effective solution. Today with modern reef keeping methods, nitrate control should really be a concern of the past. Now we have nitrate reactors, bio pellets, do it yourself in commercial carbon dosing solutions, deep sand beds, inner layers of live rock and ceramic medias can potentially promote nitrate reduction. Skimmers and filter socks can potentially remove uneaten food and fish waste before it breaks down into nitrate. Refugiums, algae scrubbers, and the type of success that reefers are having these days means once a tank is actually established and stable, more of us can actually rely solely on livestock and a tank full of corals as the primary nitrate reduction method. So I don't think that we're going to have any issues selecting an ultra low maintenance method of nitrate filtration. So the next element we want to filter from the system is phosphate. Basically everything we just shared about nitrate and dissolved nutrients also applies to phosphate. Natural seawaters are ultra low, often sub 0.1 parts per million, but the ocean's currents provide an infinite supply in conjunction with phosphorus containing prey. However, in this case, higher levels are not just associated with higher turf and macroalgae growth, but also slower calcification and in turn slower coral growth rates. So again, I think the best practice is probably to shoot for near zero, but not absolute zero, combined with an attempt to provide phosphorus-containing prey particles or liquids like amino acids, the HANA ultra-low-range phosphorus checker being the de facto method for testing phosphate in the reef tank because it's so easy to perform and read. Phosphate is also very easy to filter out of the tank with most of the same methods as nitrate filtration, as well as the very popular filter media, GFO, which directly binds the phosphate to the filter media. GFO is probably the most popular and easy to use methods of phosphate control, but it does only focus on phosphate. Next up, most of us also want to filter out dissolved organics, odors, and color pigments which yellow the water. This can be done before or after the fact, meaning we can drastically reduce the buildup of these undesirable factors by removing food and fish waste before it breaks down with skimmers and filter socks. Or we can remove it after the fact with three different approaches. First is the use of activated carbon, which is highly efficient for this purpose, low cost and easy to use. The internal pore structure of the carbon simply absorbs the contaminants and you periodically change the carbon out. Ozone reactors or ozone fed into your skimmer is another option. Ozone has the ability to oxidize or break the long molecule chains which make up these color pigments. You can debate if it's actually filtering them out of the tank or just changing the form, but the use of ozone certainly makes the tank consistently crystal clear, color pigment, and odor free. 
The last method of filtering these elements out is filter feeding livestock. I haven't personally had this experience or tested it out myself, but there's several members of the BRS team here who swears by the use of clams as a natural source of water clarity. They're more or less filtering the water all day long. A lot of us also want to filter out the floating particulate matter, partially for nutrient control, but also simply to remove all of the suspended floating matter in the tank. I don't think that anyone likes a tank full of floaties. It just takes away from this potentially pristine looking habitat or display that we've created in our homes. The most common methods of removal are filter pad material media like filter socks, which allow the water through but capture a large percentage of the suspended particles. There are newer automated solutions like the roller mat, which can automatically detect when the pads are full of crud, rolls it up, and removes it from the tank. Protein skimmers can remove many of these particles, and in some cases, a good cleanup crew can reduce the accumulation of these particles. Lastly, a simple area which allows the particles to settle out, or a more natural filter mesh, which can be really effective at reducing suspended particles in the water. A Cato-based fuge is a good example of that, where the Cato itself tends to capture the particles and allows them to settle out to the bottom, where they can be periodically siphoned out. Moving on, many reefers elect to filter undesirable bacteria and parasites with the use of a UV filter. UV is one of the more hotly debated topics in our industry, with one camp saying they're basically worthless and the other finding a lot of value. There are a few older studies and experiments out there, but outside of that, similar to most things in our hobby, I think most of the opinions are heavily weighted on personal experiences. I do think it's worthwhile to note that outside of the hobby or home environment, UV filtration is a very commonly implemented technology by industry professionals on commercial aquaculture and public aquariums, so a lot of people who protect fish and tanks for a living use this type of technology. Related to that, I think at least one component of this eternal debate is the fact that most of the UV systems sold to the hobby for home use are poorly designed and more likely to be effective at draining your wallet than protecting your tank. The commercial solutions used by industry professionals, like those made by Pantera, formerly Emperor Aquatics, are pretty large and require fairly specific flow rates to be effective at reducing algae or parasite populations in the tank. This large size is just not that attractive at home. My personal take on this is a UV sterilizer will not replace good husbandry, feeding, or quarantine habits, but I believe it is a supportive filter of those efforts. The conundrum is I think UV is a million miles from required and likely the last filter that I would justify financially, but it's probably the most valuable when installed on a new tank rather than after the fact. In fact, it might be one of those elements that I might take off years down the road when the system is robust and stable with few new livestock additions. If you have a fortune in rare fish, real attachment to your pets, or less than ideal quarantine habits, I think a UV filter could be justified. One thing that UV will not do is help with existing bacterial outbreaks already on the fish. That needs to be treated or medicated. Related to this, many reefers commonly refer to the sterilizing effects of ozone, almost certainly because ozone is used to sterilize water in all kinds of different water applications, including drinking water. However, the concentrations of ozone are so high in these applications that it would almost certainly nuke your tank. Ozone in the tank is used in very small amounts and most reefers agree has no meaningful sterilization effect in the tank. Lastly, similar to all this is filtering undesirable algae or pest organisms from the tank. This is again related to how UV sterilizers can kill algae spores, suspended algae looking for a new home to grow, or even pests like cyano or dinos. I can tell you that I personally witnessed dramatically reduced growth of cyano and dinos in the direct vicinity of a UV sterilizer's output, and once it's turned off, it comes back again, but I haven't seen it eradicate it from the tank or anything as amazing as that. A UV sterilizer will have basically zero effect on any existing pests which are populating any surface. Only effect would be to potentially reduce the spread or speed at which it comes back after you clean or remove the pest from the surface. I think one of the potentially most valuable components in relation to a ULM would be if the UV reduced the speed at which the algae repopulated the glass after cleaning. Okay, so these are the types of filtration that we're considering today. Time to share a few thoughts from the community before we make our selection. Starting with Joey Backus. BRS, please feature this comment in your next vid. Okay, so that's the first and only time that's gonna work. Corey Strong on YouTube. I think you guys should explore using Prodibio to reduce nitrates in the reef tank. Prodibio only needs to be dosed every 15 days and takes just a few seconds to dose using their sealed vials. Using Prodibio allowed me to avoid filter socks, sumps, and a skimmer. 
ProWKZ and Dr. Tim's all offer some bacteria-based solutions designed to increase some very specific bacteria strains to filter many elements out of the tank for you. I think Dr. Tim's probably has the most straightforward claims. I have to agree this is a very interesting approach to a natural form of filtration. The Wooly Ninja 4 share, just drop the skimmer and you'll have lots of room. I know I'll probably get jumped for saying this, but you truly just don't need a skimmer in every tank. I think you'll notice that while the skimmer was mentioned as a potential filtration option for many of today's concepts, I don't think it really came across as the best solution for any of them. I have to agree that with modern approaches to reef keeping, the skimmer is transitioning from the heart and soul of our filtration approaches to more of a supportive or supplemental all-around option, which has a lot of benefits, but I think the community is slowly coming to terms that it might not be as critical as we all treated it. I will say the tremendous amount of gas exchange is almost certainly one of the most valuable components of a skimmer. In fact, a lot of reefers running high-powered fuges might find the tank's pH rises too high without the skimmer. Robert Collins on reef to -Reef shared something similar. For my Red Sea 250, it's a somatic 90, leaving out the skimmer, using the middle chamber as the fuge. Our tea party, to the point with skimmers on these tanks, I don't think that one is needed for any reason on the polyp or LPS tank. I'd actually welcome you guys running two of these with no skimmer. One run with a big ball of Kato with a strong light and the other with an ATS. I do wonder if an ATS fits the ULM criteria. Maybe the time needed to harvest the algae is similar to emptying and cleaning a skimmer cup. This is obviously becoming an increasingly more common statement. The comment related to algae turf scrubbers I think is legit. I do think an ATS is lower maintenance than say water changes or some other solutions, but many of the designs still have you disassembling and cleaning them weekly. They're awesome solutions, but I think most people would agree if you can fit it, a standard fuge is just as effective and lower maintenance. Lastly, Donovan's comment, I'm on a complete recycling method at this moment. Nothing is purposely removed, a non-lit sump with bacteria towers, a cryptic zone, and live oysters to consume nutrients and suspended detritus before it goes back in the display. Tiny filter worms, sponges, and other critters handle the scrubbing works. You really have to love this approach. Donovan was also kind enough to share images of his system and display. I have to say sharing pictures of your actual results is the most valuable thing any of us can do for the community, so bravo. If you get a chance, let Donovan know it's appreciated with a quick Reef to Reef like. I'll also say that Glenn F. had some pretty awesome results that he shared with some low maintenance goals, his approach to achieving them, and some results to be proud of. Again, the results of a well thought out approach is one of the most valuable components of any discussion, and at the heart of what we're really attempting to do with tank trials and watching the results of specific approaches. Okay, so how are we gonna approach filtration with each of our three ULM tanks? I'm sure we're gonna take some heat because we didn't do it the exact same way that each one of you would, but remember, that's likely because every single tank has somewhat different goals, space, and resources for each setup. Our number one goal here is to build the lowest maintenance system possible. Number two is really to learn something in the process and share the journey with all of you. I can tell you right now that the filtration approaches will all be somewhat different with this general concept behind the filtration approach SPS tanks generally appreciate the highest quality water, and LPS, softy, and polyp tanks tend to tolerate less filtered water. So starting with the softy and polyp tank, looking at each major filtration need, this is gonna be the simplest filtration possible because that's all we really need for a tank like this. Starting with live rock as our primary filtration for ammonia. There's no way around it. Live rock in the display is the lowest maintenance and most stable method of rapidly eliminating ammonia. For nitrate, phosphate, and suspended particulate matter, we're gonna rely solely on a Kato-based fuge. You can see all I did with our 20 long do-it-yourself sump is I wedge a piece of the extra coarse Aquamesh filter media from Lifeguard in place to separate the pump area from the fuge area. The reason I did it this way rather than using traditional baffles is because I'd like linear flow through the Kato rather than just through the top or bottom of the fuge, which baffles would create. I also don't think a bubble trap is needed because there shouldn't be many micro bubbles. And ultimately, I think the solution will be easier to clean and maintenance just because the very porous mesh can be easily pulled out and cleaned versus cleaning in between permanent baffles. Honestly, I've never used this type of mesh for something like this before, so I'll be sure to report how it works out. Outside of that, I have no question that a properly lit and designed Kato-based fuge 
can completely eliminate any concern about elevated nitrate or phosphate levels. For those of you that do want slightly higher levels, I think nutrient levels are very likely controllable simply by adjusting the amount of time the fuge is illuminated or potentially the intensity of the illumination. The reason we went with a fuge over other nutrient control methods is simply because it's so easy to implement. Basically anyone can do it. Put a proper light on a timer. Every month or so grab a handful of algae and throw it in the trash. It just doesn't get any easier or lower maintenance as long as it's designed and lit properly. A Kato based fuge works so well that the amount you feed almost becomes close to a non-issue. The large amount of food newer reefers put into the tank is likely one of the top reasons why new tanks end up in an algae outbreak and fail or get shut down within the first year. I think there's a very legit opportunity here to make that an experience the thing of the past and for the most part let reefers be less stingy with the foods they feed. Most of us will admit that feeding the fish is one of the more enjoyable and entertaining ways for our families to interact with our pets and tank. This isn't permission to be reckless, but a proper feud doesn't just eliminate most of the water pollution and algae issues related to overfeeding, but also allows us to attempt to feed prey type frozen, freeze dried, synthetic, or liquid particulate nutrient elements to the corals without major concerns about polluting the water and related algae outbreaks. This is very possibly a strong step in the right direction as we attempt to emulate many of the natural elements of the ocean reefs in our homes. I will say by putting macroalgae in the sump, our systems are somewhat similar to higher nutrient reefs, which have significant sources of nutrient pollution that exceeds the reef's ability to dilute the nutrient levels, and because of that, grow a lot of macroalgae. The difference here is we're intentionally growing the macroalgae in a remote area outside of the display or reef, which effectively soaks up the nutrients and in most cases eliminates turf algae in the reef, which in this case is our display. There are, of course, other nutrient methods that can produce similar results, and ATS or algae scrubber is a good example, and I would expect them to form in a very similar fashion. The only reason that we're not using one here is because they're just not as low maintenance as a Kato-based fuge. Most ATS designs require to disassemble them and scrape them clean fairly frequently, and a lot less forgiving if you let it go too long between maintenance. Net result is I'd just be less confident going on a prolonged vacation or work trip and assuming the ATS is running exactly the way that I'd like it to be. The Kato based fuge, I just wouldn't have any concerns about running properly while I'm away. A lot of reefers have tremendous luck with various carbon dosing solutions. NO3, PO4X, do-it-yourself solutions like vinegar or vodka, bio pellets, or more robust solutions like Zeovit's program. Setting up a doser to dose NO3, PO4X, or any carbon-based liquid throughout the day is really about as simple as it gets, and at face value, I think one of the lowest maintenance approaches to filtering out excess nitrate and phosphate out there. This approach absolutely works for tens of thousands of reefers out there, including many of the BRS team members. However, from a ULM standpoint, carbon dosing message suggests that you need to maintain the skimmer fairly well for optimal performance. I think it might be more difficult to find and adjust a dose to maintain slightly higher than zero levels. Sometimes there isn't a balance between eliminating nitrate and phosphate at the same rate, so one might still be elevated. And to be frank, there are just so many unknowns as to how the science behind all this works that it would probably still be on my mind during a prolonged vacation or time away from the home or tank. Well, the act of dosing is extremely simple. How it actually works and the impact of many variables ranges from plausible science-based guesses to fairly unknown. End of the day, a box full of Kato just seems like the easiest to implement, effective, and lowest maintenance option out there. Again, the goal here is to literally only spend a handful of minutes a month maintaining the tank. This is just gonna be the easiest path to achieving that goal. Outside of that, we're going to use a simple bag of ROX 0.8 activated carbon for filtering color pigments and other undesirable organic compounds out of the tank. Well, the bag isn't the most effective method. It's certainly one of the lowest maintenance, and I'll make that trade on a softy and polyp system. You might have noticed that there's no skimmer compartment due to popular demand. We're going to attempt this system with no protein skimmer. I do think that we can get away without a skimmer on a simple softy and polyp system like this that has very limited filtration demands. My biggest concerns will be gas exchange and pH swings, so we'll follow that closely. 
This is part of why we're running three different tank styles, because as long as you plan the livestock demands around the system, it just doesn't have to be that complex to be successful. The reality is, we don't often get to see this, but a lot of reefers who share that they have very low maintenance systems with very limited approaches to filtration also have fairly forgiving livestock choices or older, robust, stable systems with lots of livestock serving as a primary filter. So on that note, we're going to step up our filtration just a bit for the LPS tank, still live rock for the ammonia, and we're going to use a drain area, the somatic 90 sump for the Cato base fuge. Should again filter the excess nitrate, phosphate, and even serve as our primary suspended particulate filter. The large drain area we're using should be pretty easy to siphon out all of the particulates or detritus as needed. Notice we use the same aqua mesh filter material here with a couple slits cut into it to hold the mesh and Cato in this area should be really effective and easy to maintenance. We'll of course use a Somatic 90 skimmer that came with a kit as a supportive filter for uneaten foods, partially broken down foods and waste, some suspended particulate removal, and reduction of organics that contribute to undesirable yellowing of the water or odors. While any skimmer might not be the best solution for all of these functions, it is a strong supportive filter which helps achieve many of these goals while also promoting proper gas exchange. For dissolved organics, yellowing color pigments, and odors, it's ROX 0.8 activated carbon again, this time a different approach. While a passive solution of throwing a bag of carbon in the sump is certainly the easiest, I'm somewhat doubtful that this solution will be effective long enough. In this case, I'm going to use a BRS Mini Media Reactor, which is the right size for a tank this size. There's no way around it. Actively pumping water through the media will drastically improve performance and likely the longevity of the solution. Something that we'll test and report back on as time goes on. The mini reactor is super easy to use. Just remove the pump, take it to the sink and refill the cartridge. Probably just a few minute process. Moving on to the SPS tank, no surprise here, live rock for rapid ammonia filtration. We converted the main area, the skim's UP22 sump for a fuge, and use the same aqua mesh material to hold the Cato in place. In this case, we're gonna use an external skimmer for all the filtration and gas exchange advantages. External skimmers have a couple of benefits over internal. One, they don't need to be inside the sump, so they're more space flexible. But they're also a recirculating design, which means the feed pump and the bubble pump are separate. Because the bubble or air pump doesn't have to fight the same amount of head pressure as a single pump design, this almost always drastically increases the amount of bubbles and amount of air water interfaces for the proteins to attach to often transitioning from a couple inches of foam head to the entire body containing the air water interface using the exact same pump. Since the feed pump is also separate, this gives us the opportunity to independently control the contact time and flow through the skimmer, which gives us more time for the skimmer to remove the unwanted contaminants or alternatively increases the turnover and the amount of times the entire system water volume passes through the skimmer per hour without affecting the foam pump's performance. I would note that while external and recirculating skimmers are often grouped together because almost all the common external skimmers are recirculating, you can have all the benefits of a recirculating skimmer in your sump as well. Something we did on the BRS 160 with the skims recirculating skimmer. In this case, I really wanted to use the Reef Octopus Regal 200 external skimmer. Simply put, when I asked everyone here what their favorite skimmer was, where money was no object, just best performance, Almost the entire CS and video team said the Reef Octopus Regal, and I have to agree, primarily because it just works. But more importantly, the DC pump is not just silent, but also reliable. I think it is notable that the BRS customer service would select this one because they hear experiences from such a large volume of people, and when they all agree on something, it's almost always a very accurate depiction of what most of us can also expect. However, the smallest Regal they make is eight inches and just way too big for our application and space available in the cabinet. So since it's done such an awesome job on the BRS-160, I'm gonna stick to the same series of skimmers and go with the Skims SM-122 recirculating skimmer, which is one of the smaller, well-designed recirculating options and perfect for this application. That said, I think we're gonna do something a bit different here. Rather than relying on activated carbon and periodic changes, we're gonna run ozone on the skimmer. This is gonna keep the water crystal clear 24 seven all the time without the need to ever change up carbon and inevitable increases and decreases in water quality that approach has. That said, we're gonna approach ozone slightly different than most reefers use it. 
most ozone implementations are after a very specific ORP goal, which is generally thought of as a measurement of water quality. But in reality, that's a bit of a stretch of logic. It might be an indication of that, but it certainly doesn't mean that in all cases. In our case, I don't really have an ORP goal. I'm going to use ozone to a more specific goal, which is keep the water crystal clear, meaning I'm going to use as little ozone as possible to achieve that goal, meaning I'll set both the ozone generator as low as possible and potentially only run the ozone for a portion of the day to achieve that goal. I will monitor ORP and have a controller to turn the ozone generator off if the ORP were to get too high, but that's just as a safety precaution. So again, I'm not using ORP as a goal, crystal clear water as a goal. To identify if that goal has been achieved, the tanked water should be visibly indistinguishable from freshly mixed salt water, something that's easiest to identify by removing some of the water from the tank and looking at it in a white bucket. It should be crystal clear with a blue tint and no yellow at all. A periodic test will certainly perform and share the results as time goes on. I would note that at higher than desired levels, ozone is not healthy to breathe in your home. There are a lot of ionic home air filters that use this type of technology, so it's not foreign to the home, but you should take precautions to remove it appropriately, most commonly by putting carbon over the skimmer cup where air is released as well as on the water exit. Ozone also has a distinct smell of a lightning storm when it's elevated, but there are also tests or alarms you can use as a backup. In all honesty, ozone has been something that I've avoided in the past because I didn't need the complexity, but for this series, it's potentially the lowest maintenance option out there to keep the water crystal clear 100% of the time. I'm certainly going to look into some various ozone tests on both air and water and share the results of various approaches once the system's up and running. Somewhat related to that, we're going to run a Pentair 24 watt UV sterilizer on this system. The primary reason is not to protect against fish disease or parasites, but in a ULM system, the goal is going to be to identify if the use of UV decreases the rate of algae that lands and repopulates in the glass, meaning reduces the maintenance or frequency of cleaning the glass. I've read a lot of anecdotal reports that UV does cut the need to clean your glass in half, but I don't have any actual experience that would support that. So in this case, once the tank is up and running, we'll attempt to turn it on and off for periods of time and share what, if any impact, it has on algae growth on the glass. The fact that there is some protection for the fish as well is just a side benefit in this case. I will note the reason we put the UV filtration on the SPS tank is less because we want increased water quality standards on the SPS tank and more so because the SPS tank lighting is much, much brighter. And because of that, the algae film in the glass just grows a lot faster as well. Meaning the frequency you need to clean the glass is almost always much higher with an SPS tank. With a ULM, we want to look at every approach out there to reduce that need. However, if we do find it's an effective approach, I think that we'll put UV filters on all the ULMs as well. So that's the basics behind how we're going to approach filtration with these ULM systems. And I'm dying to know what all of you think about our approach, what you would have done differently, or anything that you might be excited about watching as progress goes on. Next week, we're going to select our ULM plumbing, ULM return pumps, and ULM heater solutions. I just got one question for everyone watching. What does ultra-low maintenance mean to you when we say plumbing, return pumps, and heaters? Don't forget, we're giving away one of the hearts and souls of our filtration approaches this week with the Kessel H380 Horticulture LED lamps. Check out the link in our description below, or head on over to the site, hit sales and deals, and then free stuff to sign up. As always, if you like what we're doing here, give us a quick thumbs up and hit that subscribe button because we release new reefing videos all week long. See you next Friday with another episode of Beerus TV Tank Trials, ULM Edition.